Good afternoon. I am a council member Mark Jonai, chair of the Committee of Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our hearing on the restaurant industry, the very important restaurant industry. Thank you for making time for us today. Mom and pop restaurants are beloved institutions in neighborhoods across the city. Whether it's a diner, a pizzeria, a local cafe, or a quick service restaurant, the meals we share at these places and the hospitality of the people that run them enable individuals and families to form memories and bonds of affection that span generations. But recent years have not been kind to the local entrepreneurs who are small business owners, many of which are minority and women-owned businesses. Rents have skyrocketed, <coughs> lower co labor costs have nearly doubled, and new policies have upended a regulatory climate that has not been particularly stable to begin with. According to data from the Federal Reserve, full-service restaurants in New York City have shed roughly 2,000 jobs over the last two years. Just last year, iconic institutions such as Casa Neta, Tortilla Flats, and Cornelia Street Cafe all closed their doors. The Department of Small Business Service operates a number of programs that are designed to facilitate not only the growth and development of food service establishments, but also skills developed for aspiring entrepreneurs. I'm excited to learn from the perspectives, experience, and data provided by SBS, the roughly 24,000 restaurants in New York City serve as an important entry point into the labor force for thousands of individuals, including myself. In fact, one in three people get their first job in the restaurant industry. Restaurants are a major draw for tourists and provide nourishment for New Yorkers. I'd like to see city agencies doing everything in their power and everything that works so that this sector can expand rather than stagnate or be run out of town by overregulation and taxation. Regulations like the Fair Work Week package passed in 2017 are actually hurting the very people they intended to serve. These mandates on small businesses, while well intended, are overly restrictive and financially burdensome while adversely affecting the day-to-day -day operations. We can agree that the concept of providing two weeks advance scheduling notice helps employees. However, additional rules that penalize small business owners, forcing them to pay fines or premium pay to employees looking to fill a shift, actually prevent those shifts from ever being filled. This means fewer hours for employees who want to make extra money and an increased workload on those employees on shift while understaffed. I'd like to thank the committee staff, Council Irene Bovosky, Policy Analyst Michael Kurtz, as well as my Chief of Staff, Reggie Johnson, and my Legislative Director, Darden Jambale, for making this hearing possible. Finally, I'd like to recognize the committee, chair, committee members that are here with me, Council Member Ayala, and others that will be joining us. Thank you for being here. Our first panel is SBS, Jackie Milan, and Stephen Picker. Can we swear you in? Yes. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank I you. Do. Is this working? I can't tell. Yeah, it's on? Good. Good to go? Good. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Jackie Mallon, and I'm the first Deputy Commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. At SBS, we aim to unlock economic potential and create economic security for all New Yorkers by connecting them to quality jobs, building stronger businesses, and fostering thriving neighborhoods across the five boroughs. I'm joined by my colleague, Stephen Picker, the Executive Director of our Food Service Industry Partnership. Today, I'm pleased to testify on our support of the New York City restaurant industry. There are a little over 20,000 restaurants in New York City, employing over 270,000 New Yorkers. Restaurants are present in almost every neighborhood and are essential to our city's identity. To assist restaurant owners, SBS offers many resources that help them start, operate, and grow. Our services to support restaurants include our client manager and compliance advisory services, which help restaurant owners navigate the regulatory process and ensure they're in compliance with regulations necessary to maintain public health and safety. We also help restaurant owners access capital, hire new employees, and fund employee training through our NYC Business Solutions Centers. On an average annual basis, SBS helps open up roughly 500 restaurants fill nearly 3,000 open positions at restaurants and connect about 100 restaurants to around $4 million in financing. SBS also works directly with the industri restaurant industry through our industry partnership known as the NYC Food and Beverage Industry Partnership, 
which is made up of over 30 New York City uh, restaurant industry leaders, key professional associations, and community-based organizations that focus on skills training. The partnership allows us to work directly with the industry on priority issues, impacting both employers and workers to support the growth of the industry. Key priorities include helping restaurants navigate the regulatory environment, addressing the demand for, for skilled workers, and providing support to adapt to the rising cost of doing business in, in the city. While protecting public health and safety is essential, we know that government regulations are sometimes not totally clear or straightforward for business owners. This is particularly true for restaurant operators who typically interact with multiple reg regulatory agencies. One of the first efforts to address the regulatory concerns of business was the Small Business First Initiative launched in 2015. The mayor's multi-agency effort, including DOHMH, FDNY, DCA, DOB, and DSNY, helps businesses understand and comply with city regulations, reduces the regulatory bur burden on businesses, and ensures equal access to, to city support for all business owners. We developed SB 1's 30 commitments based on the feedback from hundreds of business owners. Some examples of the ways we've helped business save time and money include creating an online portal where businesses can see all their interactions with the city, launching a first-of-its-kind compliance cons consultation program, streamlining regulatory agency processes. The NYC Business Portal has had more than 17,000 accounts created with a monthly average of more than 100,000 unique visitors since launching. To provide direct support to businesses, SBS cross-trained new staff called compliance advisors in the regulatory requirements of various agencies. Armed with this information, these compliance advisors were able to complete more than 2,600 on-site consultations for restaurants, helping these business owners to avoid common violations before their inspections. SBS has also worked with agencies and council to streamline time-consuming and costly processes for businesses. This past year, we worked with council to establish Local Law 195, which consolidates processes for fire suppression systems, fire alarm systems, and fire protection plans solely under the purview of the FDNY. Or FDNY. Prior to the implementation of this local law, the approval process for these systems required restaurants to engage with both DOB and FDNY. These processes change changes will reduce the cost and administrative burden on businesses, saving them both time and money without compromising public health and safety. SBS looks forward to continuing our work with agencies and council to make it easier for businesses to comply with rules and regulations. Restaurants are also currently undergoing an unprecedented labor shortage. Shortage. Members of our industry partnership cited the recruitment of skilled employees as one of the most important challenges for their industry. And to address this need, we launched Stage NYC, a three-month program connecting out-of-school, out-of-work youth with rewarding careers in the New York City restaurant in industry. The program was designed to help meet the restaurant sector's growing demand for qualified culinary employees while creating new career pathways for New Yorkers. Participants receive paid on-the-job training with an industry partner. And this hands-on experience allows participants to gain all the tools needed for success in the growing restaurant industry. We are now refining the program based on lessons learned from the initial pilot and plan to launch another cohort early this summer. In addition, through SBS's customized training program, we provide funds to restaurants and other businesses to offset the cost of training for their current staff so that they can advance to, to higher paying jobs. SBS also helps businesses adapt to changing local trend, uh, trends, such as shifting neighborhood demographics. For example, where changing markets may prompt landlords to speculate or harass existing commercial tenants, SBS provides free legal services through our commercial lease assistance program. Businesses, including restaurants, can work one-on-one -on -one with attorneys to review lease renewal terms, negotiate with their landlord, and even prepare court papers and motions when litigation cannot be avoided. Restaurants have raised concerns with adapting to new mandates that have increased costs. In recent years, New York City has been on the forefront of providing essential basic protections to workers. Since the start of this administration, the city has given workers of private employers the right to paid sick leave and required private employers to provide employees with sexual harassment prevention training and information, and most recently, Mayor de Blasio announced paid personal time making New York City the first nation in the nation to offer personal time off for workers. This comes along with mandates from the state, including paid family leave and an increased minimum wage of $15 for, for businesses with 11 or more employees. While SPS fully supports the expansion of these critical worker protections, we have also heard from restaurant owners who are struggling to adapt. To assist, SPS offers business education resources to help businesses to assess their costs, reduce unnecessary expenses, and increase their revenue. This allows businesses to prepare for different forms of business interruption and expensive expenses. SBS also helps long-standing companies adjust to changing working conditions with Love Your Local. Through this program, businesses receive expert business advice and, if eligible, grants of up to $90,000 for adaptation. These programs allow us to test and analyze business interventions with the hope of scaling effective solutions. As you can see, SBS is an advocate for restaurants and we are committed to ensuring their success in New York City. We are unique among our peer agencies as our role is to serve as a resource to all business owners and workers, no matter where, they're, where they come from or what barriers they face. We look forward to learning more about the issues restaurants are facing and work to address them. Thank you, and I am now happy to answer your questions. 
Thank you. So let me begin by addressing the 900-pound gorilla in the room, uh, which I'm sure uh, you are well-versed in now. We're, I think we'll be celebrating our one-year anniversary This is soon. true. This is true. Uh, it's almost, uh, it is over a year ago that I requested from SBS the 6,000 rules and regulations uh, that I'm aware of that exist. The SB1 was created just for that one purpose, to review the 6,000 rules and regulations, to decide or decipher which are outdated, overburdensome, and streamline, and make it an easy to read and to follow, trans transparent way, so our small businesses have a fighting chance. It's one year later since my request it is four years since the formation of SB1, which I believe now is more, has cost taxpayers more than $30 million. And the last fact that I received, SB1 was able to modify 80 regulations, which means they made them more complicated instead of getting rid of them. Um, can you please update me? Sure. On um, oh, sorry. When I'll be when I, as chair of small business, when will I receive those 6,000 rules and regulations? When will we create a format which our mom and pop business owners will know what laws they have to comply with rather than find out the hard way, which is normally through a violation that requires them to pay a hefty fine? Good. Yep. Okay. Um, so we always disagree a little bit on the number. We say 5,300, you say 6,000, whatever. Reminder. Um, <laughs> um, By the way. Reminder, that, they do not all apply to businesses. So that, right. That's the complete set of, of rules for both businesses and, and But that's the number that just the, so we make it the I red know. tape commission provided from uh, the controller's office. And that's the number that I was given. And until I see them, we can't even decide is it 5,300 or 6,000. Un un understood. Understood. And, and SB1, the, the overall intention of SB1 was not to eliminate rules per se. Mm. There, what part of it was a, a rule review, and you're right. We identified 80 um, rules that impacted businesses and made modifications, and those are in play. Um, in addition, we, as I said in my testimony, we launched the, the business portal where you can everybody can get online and, and, and easily figure out all the different rules and regulations. In fact, all your, your Interactions are aggregated for you when you open up accounts, so it's been you know improved a lot in terms of transparency. Um, compliance advisors, I talked about in my testimony, we've talked about in the past. They are available to all businesses. They go out pre-inspection, work with the business to sort of walk through their situation, advise them on what they should change so that they are not um, going to be in violation. Violations have have come down um, during this administration. We've talked about that as well in the past, and so the list of of six thousand rules, I I. It sounds like you're requesting that I deliver you those in, is that right? <laughs> in like a, a package? I'll take them on any format that's <laughs> possible just so I can count them myself and yeah. help understand what uh, everyday small businesses have to go through or what they should be going through um, and making it a lot easier for them by perhaps, and again, I go back to not a single rule was removed from the books took me almost a year or nine months to argue that the outdated signage laws that date back to 1961 where our small businesses were receiving fines between 5,000 to 20,000 on a sign that's been up for decades that the city turned a blind eye to and overnight uh, allowed enforcement and where uh, a very sophisticated group we're using 311 as a weapon, virtually putting these small businesses out of business over an a outdated law that should have been revised decades ago. Mm -hmm. and, and just to, just to give you, the law required no more than 12 square foot of print. It does. It didn't even allow for a phone number to be included. So in the last 50 plus years, si nearly 60 years, the amount of marketing and the perception of marketing has changed so much 
and yet that one room where thousands were literally forced out of business over the years that could not possibly pay the fee, hire the architect that was needed, and have a new sign installed was unfair. SB1 should have been at the forefront on that. They never picked up the issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, we've had this uh, conversation. I, I, we really appreciate um, the council's uh, passing along. We look forward to, to working together on its implementation and getting the word out. Rules are in place to ensure that the public is safe and, and healthy and the quality of life is maintained. And I think through SP1, we, we have made a lot of improvements. It, clarity, one of the, we talked to over 500 business owners when we put together the, the 30 commitments. And the, essentially the number one thing that, that frustrated them more than anything was, I don't understand the rules. It's not transparent, it's not clear. I don't, and so many of the things that we put in place, I think are addressing those points. If you've been, on, have you been on the NYC business portal yourself? Do you, I mean, if you want to find the rules, actually, for businesses, that's an excellent way for you to do it because you can easily go through and, and use easily. the tool. Yeah, no, I, I. Jumps from agency to agency. Uh, it depends. And no, you just put in your, the type of business that you're, that you're uh, wanting to investigate. It, it all pops out for you. I mean, I'm not saying it, it, it's an, a digital tool. It should always evolve and, and get better as, as we get more users and we learn and that and that. But I think it's pretty excellent. I, I'm going to stand on that one for sure. <laughs> In terms of transparency and, and clarity, which is a lot of what this was about. Well, we'll have to have a special hearing on easy or <coughs> transparent at another date. Um, <laughs> as recently as, as January 2019, several of our restaurants have closed. Mm -hmm. And I have roughly 30 that I'm aware of, including a, a diner in my very own district, uh, Pelham Bay Diner, where after 47 years, closed up its doors. And it wasn't rent. It was the overburdens, the regulations, taxation, and the inability to compete that forced them out. What is SBS going to do as these businesses make decisions where they can no longer compete, no longer um, satisfy the needs of the employees and government. And we've done a great job at pegging employees against employers. And all the employers that I've been speaking to over the last year, they'll come back with the same commitment. I need a happy employee. I want my right. employees to be happy. I just, my bottom line doesn't support satisfying the employees and government, mm -hmm. and I can't fight government. I don't have the resources. How do we respond to a small business owner who says, I want to do right. I want my employees to be able to earn a decent living, be happy to come to work, they'll provide better services, there'll be less turnover, they'll advance in my place of business. I just can't do it. And regulation is their number one concern that prevents them from focusing on the needs of their employees. What can we do to So get it sounds ahead? like, like, like you, um, and we agree, and we support um, all of the, uh, all the policies that are in place to, to support workers and their financial stability and protections and so forth. And that's what we hear from businesses as, as well. Mm. Um, as I said, we have, through SB1 and other measures, we have instituted lots of reform and uh, refining of processes and all kinds of things that are intended to make it much more clear on how to do businesses. <coughs> Violations have gone down uh, during this administration. I, I don't what's that, Can you be you say, more, what's when that? When you say violations have gone down, do you mean the number of violations have gone down yes. or the actual income that is derived from both. violations? Both. I believe both. What are those numbers? I do not have the numbers on the top of my head. Can we request those numbers <laughs> because I, 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 there are going to be plenty of people that are going to testify today on their first, on their own experiences that they are fear, that they are targeted, which leads to the next. Yes. But when, when you say, what is it that we can do? There are many that have lined up here today to testify. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but compliment them because they're speaking for the many others that are afraid to attend a hearing 
that'll talk to me off record, that'll talk to me on background, but are afraid to appear at a hearing to be heard because of fear of retaliation from this city. Mm -hmm. For fear, and there's a real belief that if they are heard, that miraculously the Department of Health will appear, Department of Buildings, and a number of city agencies at their establishments issuing more violations than summonses. That's not the government that we're supposed to have. If we're gonna force the growth and really consider our small business as a partner that helped this city thrive, that should be a challenge that I would imagine SBS would wanna meet on head first. Mm -hmm. To say you, and please elaborate or interrupt at any moment on this. <laughs> what is it that you want to do to let these small businesses know on record that you will never be retaliated against. Mm -hmm. uh, on record, it's not my impression that there that is the way that, uh, and, and, and I just want to remind you and everyone, um, we are not a regulatory agency, mm. right? That is not us. We are the Department of Small Business Services, and so um, my knowledge is, is, is what it is. Uh, my understanding of, of the way that, that inspections occur is really on a, a, a risk basis, right? So if, if somebody has, has had violations, uh, they're more likely to get inspected more frequently. Other than it's, there's no one's being targeted. It's, it's merely a function of what has happened before. And as I said earlier, we have instituted some programs and some, some made some changes to some processes to try to make it easier. Compliance advisors are available to every business in the city. They can call, make an appointment. We will be on site. We will take a look. We have a, a cross-agency knowledge of, of the most common violations. We provide advice and, and violations are in fact avoided through that process. So I would encourage everyone that's here to, to call us, tell your <coughs> fellow business owners we are you know here to try to address that. Before you get into the compliance advice. Yeah. But the specific the, the, the belief that if they speak up that they will be attacked and targeted. Uh -huh. Now I understand that you're not a regulatory agency. That's correct. But you're I would imagine you care for the well-being of our small businesses. I do. And if this is a belief that our small business owners truly in their heart believe that if they complain, they will be targeted as an establishment or an industry, that's not what SBS, I would imagine, would want our small business community. Uh, Nor are regulatory agencies, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I don't think anybody would but want that. But this, is, common, this is a common belief. What can we do? to help we uh, reinforce the notion that they will not be under attack, that they will, because they spoke up, they will not become a target. Um, we can certainly uh, convene uh, members of the various agencies and, and have discussions. I, you know, I, I, I just, it is my firm belief that the, there is no system of retaliation against small businesses in, the, in this, this city by our regulatory agencies. I think they are, um, trying to, to regulate so that the public is, is safe and stays healthy and quality of life is maintained. And I think that, it, that their enforcement is done on the basis of uh, risks, perceived risks. That is my understanding. But I'm more than happy to participate in, to, to convene other partners at other agencies, to bring people together and have open discussions about it. I'm going to give you a perfect example. Yeah. The initiative uh, by this administration on clear curbs. Familiar with the program. Overnight it appeared on the books. No parking from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. No parking from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Literally destroyed commercial corridors. It was a pilot program that wind up being a disaster. Mm -hmm. Those small businesses were being forced out of business. When I met with them, literally crying, saying that I cannot pay my bills. What this has done to my business model is completely undermined it. I serve coffee. If I can't have cars pull up to my establishment, I have to park seven blocks away. They're not coming in for my donut or coffee. They're going mm -hmm. to my competitor. So please come and join me. Let's make sure that we make a presentation to DOT and explain what this program is doing. Oh no, I can't do that because if I do, the Department of Health will come visit me right after. Is verbatim. I looked at him and said, no, I assure you that won't happen. No, uh, Councilman, I know. 
I know that they're going to come after me and they'll look into my place of business, they'll issue me more violations that I can't afford. That was their response. Mm -hmm. I've never felt more uncomfortable than that moment having a woman cry, willing to speak to me about what has happened, but unwilling to address the agency for fear. Mm -hmm. And that was a minority-owned, woman-owned business, an immigrant family that were working in that business, that both parents, children, everyone were partic participating, mm -hmm. just to survive. I did my best to convince her. They need to know what more can we do to assure them mm -hmm. that you don't have to fear that government doesn't have a pair of scissors on one hand and a hammer on the other. Mm -hmm. And that's your destiny, should you speak up. As, as, as small business services, we need to develop a platform that these business owners can be heard and alleviate these concerns of retaliation. Mm -hmm. Can I get a commitment from you that we could, that in the future, we'll do our part to let them know that they can be, that they can speak out? Absolutely, I, I we were happy, happy to work together to, to uh, ensure that people are are um, not fearful that the that the agencies are are. Agencies of retaliation, because I, as I said, that's my firm belief that they are not, and uh, we will do whatever we can to work together to to assuage people of that fear. And that includes the people in this room that may be afraid to use their the names of their locations. Yeah, understood. And if in the upcoming weeks and months they are targeted, mm -hmm. we're going to have to revisit this, and I will be fighting with them, standing shoulder to shoulder, pushing back it to show that the most democratic city in the world. Yep shouldn't be attacking its small businesses, but making the partner or embracing them as the partners that we need to. Yep. And as I said, you have our, my full commitment. And in the meantime, it, before we can get the message out at scale, we have client managers available. They should feel free to contact our, our folks. Um, and on a situation by situation basis, they will get involved and, and do uh, whatever they can in the meantime. And you, you often mention this uh, ability where we can bring in the various agencies to walk through a place of business to avoid uh, non-compliance with regulation. And what we often leave out is they only focus on the most common violations. And I go back to that number. It's not the 6,000 or the 5,300 regulations. They focus on the most common, mm -hmm. which means that you can have a walkthrough at all of these agencies the very next day an agency can walk in and a violation can be issued. Where's the trust factor? I want to comply. I want to make sure that I'm, all, all the rules and regulations I'm adhering to. I'll more than happy take time to sit with you and go through my establishment to make sure that I'm in full compliance and yet still find themselves out of compliance. This is their feedback. So we're not doing enough. It's, at best, scratching the surface. But there's no protections for them. Say, hey, in good faith, working with them, assuring them, if the walkthroughs are done, and we give you a clean bill of health, that maybe the next, if, a, if an inspector walks in, that that violation should not come with a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Giving you time to cure, mm -hmm. that would be embracing the small businesses that, are w that want to comply. Mm -hmm. and, and that is true in, in, in many cases. Um, and you know, we can work together to evaluate uh, other instances where that can, we can take that approach as well. Well, that's a commitment that I, I hope that we can work on. Yeah, you mentioned the no compliance doubt. advisors. Yes. And, and I just want, how often does the hospitality council meet? Uh, our industry partnership. Is that what you mean? Um, yeah, I think that's what you mean. 
the hospitality I, council. I didn't put compliance advisors in the, in the, in the partnership together. That's why. I'm sorry. Um, well, so SBS announced that New York City Food and Beverage Hospitality Council in September 2016. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which includes more than 30 leaders and experts in the hospitality industry across the city. When was the most re recent meeting of the Hospitality Council? I don't and what were the biggest takeaways from that uh, meeting? About two months ago. About two months. Yeah. About two months ago. And how many meetings have you had since the September 2016? I will say roughly six or seven, I can get back to you more specifically, with the whole group. And they sometimes take different formats, and so sometimes it's it's uh, uh, Stephen one-on-one -on -one with a few businesses, but the whole group probably like essentially quarterly, but I would have to look back. What were the biggest takeaways from those meetings? The key, in general, the, the and I'll let you uh, jump in as well, mm -hmm. the, uh, as I said <coughs> in my testimony, key priorities were the unprecedented uh, labor shortage, for in particular skilled workers. Um, navigating the regulatory environment, what can we do? What more can we do? How, what else can we change? Um, and the, the rising costs, uh, what, what can we do to mitigate those together? What solutions are, are um, gonna be most effective? Where are the pain points, that kind of thing? Do you wanna? Sure, sure. Um, as someone who, like you, who grew up with this industry. Um, I owned a restaurant for almost 20 years in the West Village, um, closed it in June of 2016. So I'm really, really well aware of the difficulties of operating a business, much less a food service establishment or restaurant in this city. Um, I engage in daily conversation with one operator or another. And as Jackie just mentioned, it's labor, the difficulty of closing the skills gap, meeting the labor shortage. It's being able to keep up with the changing landscape. Um, and a lot of the work that I've seen, I've been with SBS now eight months, and a lot of the work that I see being done there and that I am working towards has to do with assisting businesses to navigate the changing landscape. That includes rising costs, that includes how the, the market in the city is changing, and it's, it's a problem. This has always been an incredibly difficult business, um, incredibly difficult to keep up with on the day-to-day, -day, and incredibly difficult to keep up with on the day-to-day, -day plus keeping in touch and, and understanding all the rules and regulations that need to be adhered to, that in my interactions with people like yours, everybody, all operators want to. They, they want to do so for the protection of their workers, they want to do so for the protection of their customers, and obviously, at the end of the day, the protection of their businesses. So uh, what have we done in hearing their concerns, um, specific to, uh, obviously, the labor pool is a variable that changes, mm -hmm. uh, and matching up employer with employees, uh, <coughs> only a portion of the back. What have we done to address the other concerns? The concerns other than meeting the labor. That's right. Got it. Would you like to address that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, we worked together, I, I wanna just, re it's in my testimony, but we did work together to put together a, 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 a program called Stage NYC, which is a, a sort, of, sort of an apprenticeship-like program that takes out of school out of work youth and gives them um, some up from training and then puts them in the back of the restaurant so they can learn the skills and start their culinary career. So that, we did that. Um, we also spent a considerable amount of time hearing um, about one solution that the industry is um, very in favor of, and that's um, making a modification to the, the uh, rules um, that would allow for a surcharge. And we, we talked about that a lot. That's one solution. That's one way of, of maybe um, generating more revenue to, to deal with rising costs. And we brought it to, to the administration and our partners, and ultimately, um, the administration determined that it wasn't good for consumers, and so that is not a solution that we're going to be able to move forward with. And we're we're working through other um, methods. Uh, Lovely local is another example of like a, a a program that is intended to try to get under what uh, the the uh, how to combat changing market conditions and uh, figure out with real life examples how to scale solutions that could be available to others. So I just want to go back. I figured you would. You, you, uh, you, you heard the stakeholders. Yep. You went to the administration. Yep. 
you presented their case, and the feedback. Together we did in, in, in parts, but yeah. Uh, and the feedback was not this is not the best interest of consumers. Mm -hmm. Why would those business owners come back again if we couldn't even help deliver? Well, because I said it's, that's one solution, which, uh, you know, I understand. Which is probably the sim most simplest of them all. I, I, it's, it's clearly not simple. Hmm. Um, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there we have a series of issues that we're trying to work to. Th it makes a lot more sense, in my opinion, to continue to work <laughs> together than it, than it does not to because, um, like, you know, it's a complex set of problems. And, and so... It's not always one thing that is going to be the thing. No, we know, and that's, that's the problem. Succeeds. It's not one bit. It's not one regulation. It's not one mandate. Um, it's when you put it all together. So whether it be, and I, and I want to reiterate, and I don't think you're going to hear otherwise from any of these employers, they really want happy employees. I, I, that's it's very consistent what we hear as well. And let's look over the last few years. Yeah. Health insurance. Mm-hmm. Paid family leave, sick leave, uh, vacations, minimum wage increases. These are all wonderful things. I'm not, and I, I, you won't get the pushback from the employees that want to provide these protections to their employees. We just can't do that plus real estate taxes, water and sewer violations, and their bottom lines don't sustain it. So of, of all these variables, the rules and regulations, which we make, we enforce, we penalize, that's the one variable that I would imagine would be the easiest challenge. So, you know, let's reduce the fees, let's remove some of these mm -hmm. fines. And the administration came back with not in the best interest of consumers. Yeah, well, that's not exactly apples to apples, what you just said, but, because um, that wouldn't be, that's not, they're not asking for a reduction in fine in that case. I'm sorry? They're not, th th this particular solution is not about reducing fines. Mm. Um, Getting rid of them all together is probably <laughs> what they asked for, but. Uh, not exactly. So, um, as I said, um, fines, uh, violations have gone down in this administration. We've implemented a number of things that are, are intended and I think successfully make the rules transparent. We've tried to proactively ensure that people are on site helping business. I, th I'm not suggesting that we're done. There's, <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's an ever evolving um, process and the world changes, technology changes, things change. And we are committed to continuing to work together to try to continually make it better and make it easier. Right. Uh, I'm, we're going to continue this. I just want to yeah. acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Rivera and Perkins, and I'm going to open up to my colleagues with any questions that they may have. I will first. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I wonder, out of all of the new in, uh, mandates that have been implemented um, in the last few years, is there a, a specific mandate that bothers the restaurant uh, owners the most? Like, is there one that, you know, you're consistently hearing about? Um, I'll go first, and then if you want to mm -hmm. um, chime in. Uh, no, that not, not, as, not as specific. And, and I would agree with, with uh, the chair. M most of what we're hearing is talent is really important, and, and our workers are super important. They make or break our, our success, particularly in a restaurant, because it's so people intensive. But in general, costs are difficult. And and the, the pace at which that some of these costs have been rising is a little bit, you know, quicker than might be comfortable. That that's would you disagree? Is there something uh, specific? No, I completely agree. So, uh, is SBS, does SBS have a mechanism to track the number of employees that maybe will let go as a result of these new policies? Um, n not a like a real time. Um, mm -hmm tool, you know, typically we rely on, on data that is collected through the federal government. Okay. Which is, has a lag, usually, a little bit. Do you track the number of businesses that have been forced out as a result of rental increases? 
I'm sorry. Do you do you also do you track the number of businesses that have been forced out of business due to rental increases? Um, there is not a, a reliable uh, data set. We are actually looking at that uh, as an administration. Um, better ways of, of collecting the, the much needed evidence. I mean, I think it's helpful because it'll allow us to see where exactly which communities are, are more impacted and, and where we need to, to be channeling our, our resources. Um, so I, I, I would look forward to uh, further conversation Agreed. about that. Agreed. Um, since the, since the uh, institution of the, uh, the letter grading, has there, has there been uh, a decrease in the number of foodborne illnesses I honestly don't. I don't know the answer uh, off the top of my head. Uh, what I do know is that the the percentage of, of um, uh, letter grades that are A has gone up um, significantly in the last couple of years. But I don't know. I can certainly get back to you. That's something that the Department of Health would know more okay. readily. Now, I, I was look, I actually was reading our briefing, and uh, I noted that there are twenty six thousand nine hundred and fifty five restaurants in New York City. Of that number, just 2,434 are in the Bronx, comparable to Brooklyn where we have 6,700, Manhattan over 10,000, <coughs> uh, over 6,000 in Queens. Um, what do you attribute that to? Um, in part, I would, uh, that's sort of aligned with the, the, like the distribution of population across the, the boroughs, I think. Um, do you have the number there? Breakdown. Yeah, like there are fewer people in the Bronx than there are in Queens and Brooklyn, and so there are fewer restaurants. It's sort of my off-the-cuff answer, but um, yeah, no, that's about right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a relationship between the, the, the population size and the number of businesses and restaurants. And the number of businesses in, in the Bronx in general is, is lower than uh, Queens and Brooklyn. Okay. Um, let my, my final question. Um, so uh, as part of our... Uh, the questions back that we were, uh, the information that we received. I had a question that says that uh, it, it actually, the way that I read it, it implies that the hot bread kitchen, which is a small business in, in, my, in my district, is uh, an incubator uh, yeah. business, is <coughs> affiliated somehow with NYCHA. And I have never heard that before. It's been in my, in my district for over five years, um, and I've never heard about there being some sort of connection between um, the New York City Housing Authority, the residents, and the hot bread kitchen. On the contrary, I think people would argue that there isn't, um, there, that the, the hot bread kitchen isn't doing enough to recruit uh, members of the uh, immediate community. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little bit kind of confused I by can that. Tell you, I can tell you a little bit about the, the I, what I think I haven't seen what you've yes. seen, but I can tell you a little bit about what um, you, it might be referring to. Uh, we, in partnership with NYCHA, run a, run a program called Food Business Pathways, which is, which is targeting NYCHA residents who have had uh, some level of informal food business um, for, uh, to join the program and you know, get the business education so that they can move to, to turning it into a formal business. Did I say formal, just informal? Inf it was, it's an informal mm -hmm. business. Now we're going to turn it into a formal business and help them get licensed. And, and then uh, some of them are also given time at food incubators so they can access the commercial uh, kitchens there to develop their product. And Hot Bread Kitchen is one of the participant um, incubators. Is it a new program, though? It's uh, three years, I think. Um, about, about 300 NYCHA residents have, have completed it, and about two-thirds of those guys, uh, those folks have gotten through the part where they got their licenses and so forth. And then... As far as we know, all of them are, are operating their businesses. I would be really interested in learning more about that because I, I will tell you that I go to every resident association meeting, uh, CCOP meetings. Um, I have never, I've met with the Hot Bread Kitchen and I have never, ever, ever heard of this program. And so I'd be curious to know when it was started, how many community residents actually participated mm -hmm. and graduated from the program, um, and how many of them came from that neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I wouldn't know that off the top of my head, but I'd be more than happy to follow. I'd be delighted, actually, to, to spend some time that. talking about that. Not, not a problem. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Just to reiterate once again, the, st the stats are 50% of small businesses never make it to year five. Mm -hmm. In the restaurant industry, it's actually 80% never make it to year five. 
the obstacles that they have to overcome are tremendous. And I believe Councilman Rivera has a question. I do, thank you so much. Actually, let me. So uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I love restaurants. Let me just go on the record. <laughs> I live in a very restaurant rich district. I represent East Village. Uh, I was just in a restaurant last night in Kipps Bay on Third Avenue called My Friend Duke, new restaurant. And the owner was g undergoing, um, I think they were one of your maybe compliance advisors. Uh -huh. So you pay a hundred bucks and they come in and kind of give you a, an inspection without it being an official inspection. So you could make sure that you're dotting your I's and crossing your T's. No, right? That doesn't, that, that's, this is a similar program, but we don't, there's no fee associated with our, our program. Uh, yeah. Health, that's DOH, yeah, to sorry. be fair, they're absolutely right. That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The, they're we right, think but, so too. but I'm, I'm getting I'm getting to why okay, I'm, I'm sure. asking this, sure. and I know that as a, my husband has a couple of cafes, and it's incredibly difficult even then to survive, and he's had to pivot, and he's closed the cafe, and just even witnessing that, and and how emotionally and financially draining it is. Mm -hmm. So I commend all uh, you know restaurant and business owners because it's so hard in New York City. And I always hear about property taxes and payroll, right? Like those are the two of the most difficult things to deal with in New York City. But it's also navigating city bureaucracy and red tape. Mm -hmm. And so you said it yourself just a few minutes ago that it's really hard to navigate, and in your testimony, this regulatory environment. And so with all of the violations that you could potentially get, and even for someone who is really on it, maybe they have multiple <coughs> businesses, you know, a few little things could result in a B, for example. And I know that I'm kind of talking about DOH a, a little bit. But it could, and that kind of could really adversely impact your business. So my question to you is, in terms of some of the violations that are issued to small businesses, is there, have you not revisited or discussed or considered you know, potentially adding some of these violations where instead warnings could be issued and, and, and cure, periods where they can cure the issue could be allotted before they're actually issued a fine? Yeah, there, there are um, uh, many cases where that is true, and there have been some uh, changes uh, during this administration, but we are, as we said earlier, we talked er earlier about this, oh, very um, happy to continue to, to review and see where else we can um, uh, find instances where that would be appropriate. I just, I don't, I'm not aware of any violations that are not associated with a fine. Uh, I'm reasonably certain that um, signs for, at, at, at uh, through the, different, BCA? That's the one that we took a year. No, 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 no. There's there's signs associated with um, consumer awareness in your in your establishment. Right, which yeah, those are all uh, curable and and and, you mean and again, I am not a regulatory. Right? What's that? Yeah, the those things the, like that. The ones that and would require like about, about a, a about twenty foot wide wall, <laughs> ten feet high, to have all of the proper notices and written in different languages. To, that's the okay. Those all the, the consumer issues. protection. Um, uh, tools that are that are necessary, and I also my other and again I'm you gotta uh, forgive me I'm not an expert on on regulation but my understanding is also a, a, for a DOMH is a point system and uh, it, 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 you can uh, under a certain number of points that you get you have the opportunity to cure after the first uh, uh, before the first violation but there could be m more opportunities to put those kinds of of uh, solutions in place and we are more than happy to work together to try to. Um, uh, get there. I think there's so much opportunity. I mean, there's people in this room that could tell you countless mm -hmm. examples of, of just being able to get a little bit more time mm -hmm. to take care of it. I mean, not everyone's an expert in this regulatory environment, but just imagine between trying to make sure that you pay your staff and you have, you know, you're delivering amazing quality. It, it is a lot considering that there are hundreds and hundreds of violations that could potentially be issued to you that could actually lead to your business closing in probably a month mm -hmm. in, in this city. Mm -hmm. So I, I ask that uh, if there, and I hope that we can all work together, if there are violations in which, in which a warning could go out first or there's a longer cure period, mm -hmm. I'd really, really be advocating for that and I hope that we can work with some of the people in this room. Yeah, that would be, a, we are definitely committed to working together on that, for sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's a great point, uh, Councilwoman, and, and I guess the if it's violations uh, that are 
risking consumers' health and safety. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure that no one, um, no one's health and safety is at risk. Yep. Most of these violations are in imminent danger to someone's health and safety. Um, I'm gonna. I, I actually think the, t the top ten violations for restaurants are, are a lot things like um, to do with vermin and um, mm -hmm. food surfaces and things like that. So, which I'm pretty happy about um, <laughs> myself as a consumer. What well, and to the councilwoman's point where. Most of our small business restaurant owners are making the donuts, Absolutely. selling the donuts, delivering yes. the donuts, uh, having them understand the rules and regulations and navigate and the compliance under it is not feasible for them. They're the accountants, they're the uh, HR person, they're doing their own payroll uh, on top of it because there's no other way they can keep their business going. Mm -hmm. it, I think it, it's upon us to come up with ways to allow them to focus on their business and that's their model uh, without having to worry about the scissors or the hammer uh, which is also the definition that those business owners have given government understood we're going to continue the questions with if we understand that 80 percent of restaurants will never make it to year five what has the Hospitality Council done to change those startling numbers? So I'm going to start, and then and then I'm going to. Uh, so, with many of the things that we do as an agency, we start with a uh, with the industry and like hear from them. A as I said before, the key priorities we identified with the industry partnership are the ones I spoke of earlier. But as an agency, we are never um, you know, happy uh, to hear about businesses closing. We, we, uh, we're with you. We don't want that to happen. And uh, many of the services that we are um, offering are intended to try to get ahead of that. So lots of business education, access to financing, um, help with uh, commercial leases. All of those things are intended to, to keep businesses healthy before they get to that point, including restaurants, of course, in, uh, until they get to that point. I did you want to? Yeah, I, I only want to say that it, it's the larger restaurant groups that tend to be tend to have better infrastructure, tend to be able to foresee issues before they come up, um, be able to stay ahead of all these things. It's it's the education that I think we're working on um, in the department to try and help for small businesses, um, the businesses that are so involved in the day to day that it's much much more difficult for them to do that th that thinking ahead. To, to see what's coming down the pike, to stay on top of all the regulation. And it's that education and that working with them that's of utmost importance. And we get a lot of our information, not only on what their specific needs are, but to understand how it works best for the larger restaurant groups and how we can translate that information and get it out to the industry at large. Well, then how do we have metrics for success in the terms of the Hospitality Council? Uh, what metrics have we set up for to gauge our accomplishments? I think we're starting to work on that. This was started in 2016? Before my tenure, uh, but I completely understand. Yeah, and, and so a, a lot of the, the focus and with our industry partners in general, because if you, you may or may not remember, they are um, born out of the mayor's um, career pathway strategy. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of, of what we're trying to do is, is deal with the labor shortage. That is uh, one of the key things and we believe uh, um, our our approach is like not in terms of like uh, people trained or into jobs that you can count but more about industry partnerships are more about like what can we do systemically to make longer lasting change like why wouldn't it be good um, a, a, a in the future if employers were well connected to institutions that train people and they institutions that train people about how a really good handle on you know what it what's required in order to to succeed in a job and and they could just sort of work together like without us so <coughs> i want to answer so i come from that world also small business world yeah. whether it be one business or another they all have the same difficulty the problem with the labor 
is not that we don't have the pool to draw from. But if you're, the restaurant that you're working for is probably going to close before it even gets up off the ground, mm -hmm. draws people away from that industry. So why would I start working as a chef or a cook when it's probable that restaurant will be closed, 80% never make it to year five, so, uh, I don't know the statistics that never make it to year one, mm -hmm. where you find yourself unemployed. Some business closed in the first three months. That's after six months of construction, waiting for the liquor authority to come in and give you the approvals while you're paying your rent and making sure that you have well, a soft opening if you are fortunate to plan for one. The problem is not that we don't have the men and women that would be willing to enter, but they've been burned so many times. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I would agree with you there, but um, uh, <laughs> I just wouldn't. Um, I don't know. Would you start I, a job that I, would probably yield you being laid off within the first year? <laughs> you tell me. I think the the from what we can tell, what we're hearing, that the people don't have the skill level that is required, and th that is a, a definite gap, and that is you know, an important problem that we're trying to work together with the industry to, s to solve. Um, they, uh, they need skilled people. Uh, skills are developed. These are, whether it's a um, fast food restaurant or uh, a full service restaurant, you begin somewhere and you hope that they're going to evolve and move up within the positions and titles and that also means salaries. So true. In my own experience, I started off as a delivery person at $6 a day plus tip. From there, I went to dishwasher, kitchen, pizza, uh, and eventually became the manager before I was 16. Mm -hmm. That's how it's supposed to be. If that pizzeria would have closed within a short period of time, I would have never been able to advance. And if I would have been lo lost that employment opportunity, chances are I wouldn't have gone to another pizzeria. That's the labor problem. The skill set that you're referring to is, are you saying that we don't have enough skill set out there for waiters and waitresses and chefs and short I'm order not saying cooks that. and I'm saying that's what the industry is reporting to us. I, I didn't, I'm not, that is not my, uh, com I'm, that is literally what the group of, of um, folks that, that work with us on this have, have said there is there is a, sh a, sh a shortage of, of, of skill that we cannot find people to fill these positions that can do the job in the way we need them to which is not it's not the only industry that is that is uh, facing this, this sort of issue what uh, so skill I, it's not me you recall what skills they were referring to or is it across they, the board I think they would say across the board but the focus of stage NYC was on uh, line cooks in particular okay okay do any of you uh, have any other questions? Did she say the focus is on line cooks? No, she's not. Line cooks. Oh, line cooks. Correct. Okay. I'm looking forward to having you back. I'm sure someone's going to remain here from SVS as they hear the testimony of some of the advocates that are um, going to passionately explain what they're faced with day in and day out. Um, and I would hope that we can actually work on being proactive to their needs instead of reactive. Uh, if we understand the hurdles that they have to overcome day in and day out, one of the major concerns is, well, if I'm not even aware of the current rules and regulations that I'm supposed to be complying with, who's tracking what is working its way through government now? How do we get into them the notices that maybe you should be aware that there's a proposal as one uh, uh, of the small businesses brought to my attention? Has anyone, for fear that it would actually become legislation, is it, are we looking at potentially having 401ks and pension plans for our mi you know, minimum wage earners? Is that the next step? Meaning that there's nothing left on the table besides permanent <coughs> jobs that no one should try to push themselves and develop develop other skill sets that would 
uh, create a vacancy as they advance. Mm -hmm. And I said, I hope you don't say that too loud because someone may hear you and <laughs> next week we'll have another bill or potential legislation to look at on a hearing that this is where the fast food industry is going now. Every employee deserves a pension, 401k. Um, that we're going to make sure that they don't seek advancement, that sh they should be comfortable where they are. And I said, no, I don't think that's where I'd like to go, but I'm still of the belief that we should inspire employees to become employers uh, as they develop these special skills. Uh, and the response from a chef was, why would I do that? I make a decent salary and I sleep well at night. I don't have to worry about what's coming on a pipeline. I couldn't respond to it. But thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look forward to working together. So our first panel uh, of advocates is panel two, Andrew Reggie, uh, Robert Beckham, and Kathleen Riley. So in no particular order, Great. Um, whatever you agree to, please introduce sure. your name. If you're uh, specific to a establishment or an industry, uh, please indicate which. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit trade association that represents thousands of restaurants and nightlife establishments uh, throughout the five boroughs. I am also a member of the Food and Beverage Hospitality Council through the Department of Small Business Services, as you had referenced, as well as the chair of the city's nightlife advisory uh, board. So again, thanks for having this hearing, and I appreciate the comments of support for our restaurant industry. Funny you mentioned uh, the signs and needing a whole wall, but now actually you need a hall for all the signs that uh, have to be posted throughout the establishment. So you know, contrary to what a lot of people, uh, maybe in the public as well as in government, think, the restaurant industry is not thriving. As a matter of fact, it's going through a very challenging and transformational time. Uh, the large number of empty storefronts through probably all of your districts uh, really hits this home. Uh, the, it's really down to the onslaught of expensive and complicated government mandates that have been relentless over the years. Just the recent labor mandates alone for restaurants in New York City include a doubling of the tip wage in a mere three years, We've had six consecutive annual minimum wage increases, a $300 increase to the minimum weekly rate for salary, salaried employees, paid sick leave, higher taxes, insurance, paid sick leave, and all the compliance costs. Um, plus, plus, there's also the fact that these increases put upward pressure on the wages of all of the other employees. So if I was making, uh, you know, $15 an hour and then – uh, you know, I've been there for two years, say, and then a more entry-level person comes in and automatically gets $15 an hour. Well, guess what? I have more experience, have longer tenure. I'm going to need $17 or $18. So it's not just the base wages. It really impacts wages as a whole. Uh, and between 2010 and 2015, employment growth uh, averaged about 6.5% at full-service New York City restaurants. But in the last three years, since all of these cost increases, we've seen a massive slowdown. It appears that by the end of uh, 2018, we'll have less than 1% growth in our industry here in the city. Now, that's the worst since the Great Recession. And the decline, frankly, is directly related and tied to the pressures and rising costs. Between 2012 and 2015, the growth in full service, uh, or I'm sorry, full liquor and beer and wine licenses was nearly 23%. Today, annual growth has plummeted to the low single digits. 
in a recent survey conducted by my organization, 75% of restaurant respondents said that they will res, uh, reduce employee hours in 2019, and almost 50% indicated that they will eliminate jobs as a result of mandates. Uh, now, eliminated uh, employment growth at limited service restaurants is very similar. Um, the health department, uh, in the early 2000s, there were about $12 million a year in annual fines. That skyrocketed up to almost over $50 million back in 2012. It's dropped to about 30, but that's still $20 million almost more than it used to be when we weren't having any foodborne illness epidemic or outbreak. Uh, so uh, we really appreciate today's hearing, and uh, you know, thank you for holding it. You know, I think a lot in the industry are sick and tired about talking about it. They're frustrated and they demand reform. And we hope some of the suggestions today will lead to that. So really quickly, I want to read off a few different uh, proposals we think that the council could act on swiftly that would really help businesses, and then we could certainly work together on some others. But one, you need to pass intro 823. That's the restaurant surcharge bill that was referenced earlier. I can tell you as a member of the... Um, Food and Beverage Council, certainly workforce training is critically important. But the one issue that has continued to come up is allowing restaurants the option to pass a clearly disclosed surcharge uh, on their menus. This practice is allowed everywhere throughout the rest of New York State and the country and in progressive cities, Seattle, Los Angeles, you name it. Uh, two, we need to eliminate the unjust and inequitable commercial rent tax that's levied on thousands of businesses south of 96th Street in Manhattan. Uh, Council Member uh, Grodnick had passed some legislation several years ago, and now following uh, uh, that, uh, Council Member Powers has recently uh, introduced legislation to further reform the commercial rent tax. Um, three, most commercial tenants, they pay a portion of their landlord's property tax. If we want to help preserve small businesses, especially as real estate uh, you know, prices continue to stay so high, we could give a tax credit on the portion of the property tax that uh, commercial tenants are playing, paying. That would be a significant uh, savings. Um, we all know that restaurants are very labor intensive. Uh, there's lots of discussions uh, in other industries, frankly, maybe that don't need it, but those that definitely need types of credits are the restaurant industry. We hire people from all walks of life. You don't need a college degree. You don't need much experience. You just need the will to work hard. And I think that the city could help offset um, employing more people if we give some sort of tax break to them. Um, we can eliminate the uh, unfair and unique liquor excise tax that's only opposed on businesses in New York City. Uh, it's about twice of what it is uh, in New York City than anywhere elsewhere in the state. Uh, as Councilmember Rivera mentioned earlier, we should be looking at uh, the fines and violations that are issued under the Bloomberg administration and Speaker Quinn at the time. The city was required to review all the per violations issued to restaurants and other small businesses. Unfortunately, uh, they came back and it was uh, just the low hanging fruit, the sign violations, but there are countless other violations in the code that aren't imminent hazards to the public that certainly deserve to have a um, uh, cure period or a warning. Uh, and the list goes on, um, you know, ways that we can support businesses. Scaffolding reform we need. We need to reform the letter grade adjudication process. Um, and we can do this now, whether it's through rulemaking, whether it's through legislation. But we need to stop just talking about it, and we really need to get down to rulemaking and legislation. It's great to say that we love our city's restaurant industry, but if we really love them and we want to support them, we need to take action. And these proposals are ways to do that. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Bookman. I'm an attorney uh, in the city of New York. Uh, I came from city government, it's hard to believe, over 30 some odd years ago, went into private practice. Uh, I, I am an expert in small business regulatory work in the city of New York. I've been a friend of this council literally for decades. Uh, I am your appointee on the Health Department Advisory Board, so I will talk a little bit about that. I am your appointee on the Nightlife Advisory Board. Um, and I am counsel to the Trade Association, uh, New York City Hospitality Alliance. Prior to that, I founded the New York Nightlife Association, uh, which existed for many years when there was actually a nightlife in New York. Um, it, it's great to hear, and I, I, I don't mean to underestimate it, Mr. Chairman, it's great to hear what your opening statement was, 
but it's time for the council not just to talk the talk, but to walk the walk. And it's time for this council, just like it is for our Congress in Washington, to recognize that it is an independent body uh, that could pass legislation, that doesn't need the approval of the executive, in this case the mayor, and can even, God forbid, override a veto if they so choose. Um, if there are too many laws and regulations on the books, and there are, you have the power to change that. You don't need to work with them. You don't need their permission. You could pass legislation. And there was an attempt to do that. In the last year of the Bloomberg administration, uh, we were at the forefront of, of working with the council leadership in passing a law that the Bloomberg administration went along kicking and screaming that required the six city agencies that deal most directly with small businesses, consumer affairs, health department, <laughs> buildings department, et cetera, uh, to come up with a list in six months of every rule and regulation that could have a, a, an opportunity to cure and a warning period that would not impact public health and safety. And unfortunately, the timing was such that they delayed it beyond the deadline you gave them. So it was December of, the last, of that council and of the Bloomberg administration when they came back with their list. And all that was on it was in-store in, in sign violations, not a single one not a single sidewalk cafe violation because your planters grew over the summer so it's now 32 inches high rather than 30 inches high and you got a summons you know for that uh, true story uh, or a sidewalk newsstand that got a, a violation because it didn't have its refund policy signed when's the last time you brought something back to a sidewalk newsstand and you didn't know what their refund policy was so that was all they came back with and one prominent elected official at the time, public advocate Bill de Blasio, excoriated the council and the administration while he was you know, running for, you know, for mayor, saying this was simply window dressing. You know, we need to get to the real violations that need warnings and an opportunity to cure. You passed the legislation because something was better than nothing, and believe it or not, I think it was over $10 million a year that the city was collecting that time just in nonsense sign violations that nobody reads anyway. Um, and then we looked excitedly for when public advocate de Blasio became made de Blasio, and five years plus later, we're still looking for that legislation that he promised to get rid of hundreds of, of rules and regulations that could be handled with a, a, an opportunity to cure and a warning. Government's first responsibility, when I was at Council of Consumer Affairs, we believed our first responsibility was educating both the consumer and the business. And when we got the, we got the business to comply with something, we considered that a victory back then. Little did I know that years later, a victory would only be if they grabbed money from the business. That's considered a victory in their monthly reports now. How much money and fines did we bring in? Uh, one of the council members talked about the health department. Uh, since I'm on that advisory board, when we meet quarterly, the first thing we get is a beautiful color printout of the top 10 health department violations. If you don't have it, you should. I'd be happy to get it to you. It's, I don't need to give it to you from the last two years because it's the same one, effectively, every quarter. There are 10 violations that are the top 10 violations year in and year out. They account for 75% of all the health department violations are these 10. A third of all health department violations in that top 10 are what are considered minor violations, what they call general violations. They're not health and safety related. And every time I say to them at the advisory board, there's some disconnect here. You guys come to these hearings, you come to these meetings, you talk about how great you do with outreach and programs. They got lots of programs for helping small business with this program and that program. We go to you for 100 bucks and we teach you how to do it. Well, something's going wrong here. Either all the restaurant owners are idiots or there's something with the way you train your inspectors and there's something with these rules that year in and year out, the same 10 violations in the top 10. Maybe they're not possible to comply with, for example, in the city of New York. You know, for example, one of them is we found potential access for vermin. Not saying they found vermin. That's a different story. Obviously, that's a problem. But there isn't a restaurant in the city of New York in an old building that doesn't have a crack somewhere that's not a potential access for vermin. So you don't need to be a rocket science scientist to understand that that's going to be in the top 10 violations every year that you're hitting people for fines. Uh, the 
uh, by the way, in your answer, answer to your question about letter grades, New York, letter grades was never designed, in my opinion, to combat a crisis in foodborne illness from restaurants because there's never been a crisis from foodborne illness in New York City restaurants. We are the darling of the world, our food scene. Always has been, God willing, always will be. There's never, it's, it was a way to get more money, and it worked. Because as Andrew said, we went from about $10 million a year in fines before the letter grades to over $50 million a year in fines. Same restaurant industry, same no problem with, with, with foodborne illness. The truth of the matter is most foodborne illnesses, you can't tell where it comes from. And when you can, it's not from a restaurant. It's from, it's from your house. It's, it's from a street vendor. Uh, it's from your cat walking across your, your counter at home. That's where most foodborne illnesses come from. And since it takes 48 hours, it's really hard, hard to track. Health department will admit that. So that's not what it's about. So now they want to take credit because of legislation forced on them by the council that fines have gone down to, to 30 million. You know, I was, you know, was pre-law and law student. I wasn't very good at math, but that's still three times 10 million. When in the beginning of the Bloomberg administration, we had a world famous, you know, uh, restaurant industry that nobody was getting sick at. So I'm not impressed that they're saying fines are lower now. Lower from when? Yeah, lower from unbelievably historic highs when over $100 million a year in the Bloomberg administration, because as we know, he was very pro big business. He didn't care that much about the little small business all that much. And he truly believed that fines were a way to get compliance, not education. And so they are taking credit that five, six years later, they are still way higher than it was, but less than this unbelievably ridiculous height. I, you know, I, I, to me, that's not a, you know, a, great, you know, a great record. I was shocked to hear you say they spent $30 million so far on small business first, and you still don't have a list of, uh, you know, of rules and regulations or a list of which ones can be eliminated. You know, Give me a million dollars, I'll get it for you in 90 days. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not that hard. It's only that hard when you don't want the council to have a list of it, and you don't want to go work with them on which rules and regulations are unnecessary. And again, you have the power. A lot of these laws are laws that you guys passed, or you passed it with the authority for the agencies to promulgate regulations pursuant to that. You can, not, you can change that tomorrow. Uh, another quick example, I'm sorry, you know, we could talk and we should all day long on this. I've been doing this forever. You pass, you pass a, 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 a law, and in that law it creates a, a fine, and you state what the minimum and the maximum should be from that fine. Somewhere, so first-time violation between $100 and $500, okay? A typical example. What they have done now through rulemaking and just through policy at ECB, you know, uh, where which is the largest court in the country, based on the volume of cases they do, they've, changed, they've taken the minimum away. They said it's 200 to 500. So wait a minute. You hire an attorney, we go there, we're trying to argue for a legal term, it's called Rachmanis. I don't know if any of you understand what that legal term is. You know, it's, it's a Yiddish expression for, you know, we tried our best, we cured the violation, you know, give us a break. Uh, and the ALJ says, yes, I agree. Uh, Two hundred dollars. Wait a minute. Where did two hundred dollars come from? The minimum fine's a hundred. Oh, we're told the minimum we can we can assess is two hundred. They are overruling your legislation by changing the minimum. Can't get away with that. What legislative body would let a regulatory agency get away with that? But you, but you do. Um, pass intro eight twenty three. It's the last thing I want to say. The only jurisdiction in the country where a restaurant can't put a clearly disclosed surcharge on its menu, meeting all consumer affairs requirements as far as size of print, location, proximity, on the message, on the, on the, on the boards, wherever there's prices, we are the only jurisdiction in the United States where we don't have, as restaurant owners, the opportunity, if we cho choose, to do that on our, on our menus, while airlines do it in the city, uh, taxis do it in the city, surcharges are a way of life today. 
hotels. It's a, it's a way of your telephone bills, my God, your cable bills. Surcharges are not only required by government sometimes, but they're, they're never prohibited as long as the consumer prior to you know, ordering understands that because of increased costs, because of increased labor costs, we need an across the board 5% surcharge in all our menu prices. And, there's, and it's a 1974 consumer affairs rule which prohibits it from a time where menus were like these big books, they were printed once a year. There was this temporary spike in beef charges then. I'm not that old, this was after I came to, this is before I came to Consumer Affairs. Um, and so restaurants, you know, because of the spike in beef charges were giving people a bill, and back then their $3 steak was $3.50, you know, 50 cents, and so they passed this rule. Fast forward to now, it, it, it's nonsense. They wouldn't, they, they dragged us along for two years in, in that committee saying they were gonna take care of it. They didn't take care of it. We went to the council. Legislation was introduced by Councilman Borelli, Espinal, uh, Corgney, Kozlowitz are all co-sponsors. We had a hearing. Nobody said boo at the hearing. To sh you know, uh, last August, it's, it's scheduled for a vote, and all of a sudden, we're being attacked by the mayor and, and the mayor's uh, affiliates that we are attacking the progressive agenda by letting consumers know that all of these costs that they have been putting on us come with a cost to the consumer that it's not a magic wand. I tell clients all the time, I'm a lawyer, I'm not a magician, I can't make things disappear. So I, tell, I say that to government as well. You raise our costs, we gotta collect it some way. It's, re, it's, it's either raising costs on the consumer, which they don't want people to know about, or it's reducing profits, which people, don't, the margin is so slim anymore they can't do it, and that's why you're having a lot of closed stores. Thank you. I think that's on. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathleen Riley, and I'm the New York City Government Relations Coordinator for the New York State Restaurant Association. Uh, we're a trade group that represents food and beverage establishments in New York City and throughout New York State, and we're the largest hospitality trade association in the state of New York. Um, we've advocated on behalf of our members for more than 80 years, and our members represent one of the most largest and most impacted constituencies in the city, as nearly every agency regulates some aspect of the restaurant industry. I'm here today to voice the industry's support for lease renewal protections, which are currently proposed in the Small Business Job Survival Act, and to express concern over the unintended consequences of the mayor's proposal to mandate paid time off for private businesses. First, I will address the need for lease, lease renewal protections. New York City is facing a problem that is twofold. Beloved neighborhood staples are forced to close, either because their leases are not renewed by the landlord through no fault of the tenant or any extenuating circumstance, or the lease can be renewed, but at an impossible increase in rent. We applaud Councilman Rodriguez and the numerous co-sponsors for introducing Intro 737 2018, more commonly known as the Small Business Job Survival Act, to address this problem. The Small Business Job Survival Act, or the SBJSA, if that's actually easier to say, I'm not sure. The SBJSA <laughs> would provide commercial tenants with new protections, including recourse to arbitration in the face of the often challenging lease renewal process. The legislation would provide a fair and level playing field for landlords and tenants alike, and it would encourage reasonable lease terms and rent determinations. The SBJSA provides a detailed list of criteria to be considered for setting the rent in stark contrast to the current situation in which landlords can ask for any amount of rent without any authority to rein them in. The SBJSA also prohibits landlords from refusing to renew a lease without cause. It details the scenarios that constitute cause, requires landlords to explain and prove the cause to the tenant and allows the tenant to challenge the cause if it's dubious. At the end of the day, the legislation would provide leverage to the currently leveraged list. It's a badly needed protection for small businesses and could literally be the difference between an untimely shuttering of doors or 10 more years as a neighborhood staple. Secondly, I would like to address a looming concern for the food service industry, which is the mayor's proposal to mandate paid time off for private businesses. In his State of the City address, Mayor de Blasio requested legislation that would require private businesses with more than five employees to offer 10 days of paid time off per year. Unfortunately, the restaurant industry is in no position to shoulder yet another mandated increase in worker compensation. As it stands, businesses are struggling to accommodate the recent minimum wage hike, and the majority of businesses, as uh, Andrew referenced in his survey, the majority of businesses report some combination of cutting worker hours, cutting jobs, and raising menu prices. 
The restaurant industry notoriously operates on razor thin margins and these businesses do not have thousands of extra dollars in the budget to pay workers on days off. This point of fact that thousands of dollars in additional costs could literally shut down small businesses is something that the council has acknowledged in the past as recently as earlier this month when they passed the Awnings Act. We urge this committee to take the same consideration when weighing the impact of mandated paid time off. At the end of the day, a paid time off mandate is likely to hurt the very workers it would hope to help, as restaurant owners would be forced to cut even more hours and jobs to try to stay in business. Many workers currently in the restaurant space have chosen this profession for the flexibility it provides. So it would be deeply ironic for these same folks to lose their jobs in the name of government mandated worker flexibility. In conclusion, the New York State Restaurant Association supports the Small Business Job Survival Act as an important piece of legislation that will guarantee a much fairer lease renewal process, and we caution the committee against the negative effects of a paid time off mandate. Above all else, we hope to continue to work in conjunction with this committee to accomplish common sense regulations that benefit the entire business community, owners, workers, and the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you. I have a simple question for all three of you, if you don't mind answering. Um, your outlook for 2019, do you anticipate expansion or further slowdown with more closures? Well, closures, basically exactly what our report showed is people are panicking right now. They are cutting hours and they're laying people off. Uh, I hear more and more people saying, you know, they're just trying to make it through another year. So over the next two years, I expect more of a shakeout, more uh, vacant storefronts. And, you know, we can't just rely on people continuing to open up restaurants and employing people. I do liquor license work as my bread and butter. So th th it, I'm the canary in the coal mine. And I could tell you for sure, slow down. Um, and it's not just a slowdown. And uh, it's not just a number of places that have a health department permit. It's the type of places and how many people they employ and what they make there. So what we're clearly seeing starting last year and continuing now is the number of what we call fine dining, but where there's waiters and waitresses where they make good money. Our survey shows the average is $27 an hour in the city of New York between the tip wage and tips. Those restaurants are going out of business, being replaced by fast casual. So it's the same health department permit. So, so numbers won't tell you the truth. But those people make minimum wage in the fast casual where you stand online at the salad place. There's no tips. Those, those people are not going to be able to get, you know, uh, tr tr go to Broadway where they come to New York to work three shifts a week, um, you, know, be, you know, and so they can become the next Broadway star. You can't do that in a fast casual. So be careful with the three card Monty with, oh, the number of, of spaces that have health department permits are the, you know, the same or growing. It's the quality of, you know, and the types of employment is changing dramatically and it's not, not to the better. Kathleen? I would agree. And to even elaborate on your point about fast casual, it's not just minimum wage workers, it's also kiosks, so. Yeah, which leads me uh, to my next question. Tell me about, besides the obvious that it all been presented over regulation, forced mandates, and the bottom line is not being able to uh, substantiate businesses staying open. The Grubhub model, the mm. uh, secret, the silent partner, uh, <laughs> uh, is often referred to. Uh, oh. Yeah, I mean, these companies are basically almost like a and part. I'm not, not, I don't mean particular sure. Grubhub, but sure. just no, in general, yeah, this whole. Yeah, no, these services over the years, you know, a lot of restaurants rely on the income that's generated through these dis, uh, delivery platforms, you know, just to cover their operating costs. But they've increased the percentage that they take uh, for each order so high that there is no profit. You need the money to come in to run your operations, but the amount of money you're actually making for each delivery after they take out their service fee uh, is, you know, close to nothing. So it's a huge challenge. They're basically like a partner in your delivery service. And these days, restaurants are trying to generate revenue any single way they can. So if they weren't using delivery, they may try to do it. And if they try to do it, they're going to be paying these huge fees. And we would it, it's, uh, I'm impressed that you're aware of, the, of that issue, um, quite frankly. And we could use some council help speaking with the state because there are two state issues involved here. We've met with the Attorney General's office because there's been a huge concentration in this industry to the point where it looks and smells and tastes like a monopoly. And sure enough, their percentages have been going up since they've become a monopoly. 
I understand the percentage is high as 30 plus percent on gross That's sales. right. Is that correct? That's right. Um, and it's, uh, and, and they're not, prov- all they are is a platform. They're not even doing the delivery. So it, <laughs> just using the numbers. I mean, it should be a buck, you know, uh, you know. Just using the numbers that were provided earlier on profitability and what we've seen from 2012 and uh, last year, according to those numbers, they're no longer sustainable. Well, you, what restaurant owners would tell us is we can't live with them, but we're afraid to live without them because a lot of our customers that come into the restaurant also call through them. Um, and if, we, if they can't get deliveries through them, we may not see them the once or twice a week that they may come into the restaurant. Um, but, you know, there's a state liquor law, which a lot of these restaurants have, that says that if you participate in a percentage of revenues, you're considered a partner and you must be on the liquor license. So I've said to the state liquor authority, how could we allow these delivery services to get away with this mm-hmm. when a one-half percent investor has to be on the liquor license and these guys are in my, my right and my left pocket? And I don't think they're going out on the liquor license. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. Our, our members, I think, would, would uh, say that they're in a similar position where you sort of can't live with them, can't live without them. They, they charge fees that are always getting higher, but they're – a really important part of the distribution system as well. So, Do you see any benefit to the hospitality council? <laughs> <That's dangerous. laughs> uh, <laughs> You're speaking for those yeah. that uh, don't No, I, I, I will say the one issue has been this surcharge issue from day one. It's been clear that this is the most important priority issue of everyone on that council, or I should say the majority of people on that council, and they feel that they have just been dra- dragged along and nothing has happened at all. And then clearly at the last minute on the eve of passing the legislation, the fact that the mayor would come in with his people and undermine the whole entire process uh, is even more disturbing. Um, you know, I know both of the members that spoke uh, were on the prior panel. I know they're working hard and they want to try to help us with some of the uh, workforce issues. But again, clearly the main issue that so many people on that council want the city to address, uh, they have not. So I'd say in the estimation of a lot of those people, they would say no. My last question for you, because we have so many that are going to testify, and I hope you sit to hear some of their testimony, because they're going to share some unique personal experiences. If you had to rate uh, top three issues that restaurants are facing that we could make a change on today, um, that would actually be a determinant factor whether they stay in business or not, um, what would they be? Yeah, I, again, I, I that, you, that you have control over. That yeah. we have control over. Which is not minimum wage and stuff. Yeah. Right? yeah, one, I'd say, you know, the restaurant surcharge issue. That's very important to a lot of restaurants. Um, two, uh, doing something with property tax. Obviously, the rents have been going up, but the property tax is something that uh, you could clearly uh, assist with. And then three would be the violations, uh, allowing cure periods and warnings for non-imminent public hazard. And I'm going to assume with real estate three. taxes, you're talking about water and sewer is the same thing. Real estate taxes, that water and sewer. Would all uh, the commercial rent tax, which we should get rid of finally, uh, you know, those taxes as well. Taxes that you do have control over. The, uh, you know, the uh, liquor tax, you know, it's only four or $500, but there's no reason for it. it you know, the New York City charges. So People, basically it's taxes, reg- regulations. Uh, and the surcharge. And there, there's, there's one other thing with taxes, too. There's something on a federal level. There's called the FICA tax tip credit, which is – so you're familiar. So uh, without getting into what it is, um, the city has taken the position that it is not a allowable subtraction on your city return, um, which many accountants and businesses are questioning. Um, so if it could be allowed on a city return as a, an allowable subtraction, uh, you know, that could be a significant amount of money that could help businesses. And again, going back to your point earlier, you know, it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts. It's not just one issue. It's collectively how these issues uh, impact you, and there's not one solution. So I think we need a comprehensive um, package of bills, and it needs to move just because people come out to these hearings, but, you know, they, they need – action and that's why we thank you for having today's Absolutely. hearing I want to thank you um, and I promise you that um, your testimony is not going to fall on deaf ears um, 
you have partners that are willing to see this to the very end, you know, because the lives and the businesses that are out there are dependent on some change in there. It's actually now operating on a negative with the hopes that the tides will turn uh, for as long as they can. Critical industry, now. I'll fin finish up with one quick story similar to yours. Our former president of our association uh, who owns Carmine's Restaurant opened up one in Washington because he won't open up any more any restaurants in New York anymore. It's too, it's too, too burdensome. Um, and, he, and at the opening, he had a... He had a dishwasher, a guy he hired as a dishwasher. It was you know, not a young guy, came up to him and said, Mr. Bank, I want to thank you for this job. I want you to know that five years from now when we have our fifth celebration, you will come to me and say, John, you're the best dishwasher I ever hired. And he said, John, if in five years that's true and you're still washing dishes, then I've failed you. That's our industry. Thank you. Panel number three, uh, and I apologize and thank you for your patience. Frank McCauley, uh, James Malos, Peter Fay, and Pete Fitzpatrick. Alton. So in no particular order, uh, when you do introduce yourself by name, if you care to, please indicate what establishment or uh, industry you're with. Uh, sure. My name is James Malios. I am a partner at Key West Joint Venture in New York, and I own the Hill Restaurant in New Jersey. I'm also director of the Hamilton Road Bar in New York City. So I'm now with the Royal Oak Home in Santa Clara and the Cathedral Inn in Santa Clara. And I'm also a member of the East Midtown Partnership bid uh, uptown, so uptown from here at least. Okay, so uh, I, I've been in these, some of these things, and I, I understand how the sausage is made, much like you don't want to know always how our sausage is made. Like, I don't always like the way the sausage is made, but it's cool, and that's life, and, and I get it. Um, I'm not exactly always popular with my friends in the business community um, because I've advocated for uh, that eliminating tip credit is okay as long as we can share money with the back and front of the house. Uh, as long as I probably as well spoken about that, not well spoken certainly, but as outspoken about it as anyone. Uh, I've done a couple of cranes, stuff like that. So I'm, what I'm gonna tell you, I'm coming from that position, right? I'm not a shill. No one's like popping me up here to talk to you about stuff. Um, you can look me up online, you'll find tons of, ton of stuff. Um, when we opened our last restaurant, I opened in the Hamptons because I thought like New York was too hard. I grew up there my whole life. I, w I drive two hours to a Roman restaurant in Suffolk because New York City was too hard or too difficult. Um, you know, out there's too hard to raise money to do it. Um, and out there's no, no peach, right? It's like Roadhouse out there with Patrick Swayze, if you've ever, if you've ever seen a Patrick Swayze movie. So I'm not saying it's a peach there, but to think about, put that in perspective, 30 years in New York, some of the most storied restaurants in New York, and our decision was to go to Suffolk. Okay, I'm just gonna put that in perspective. Um, and you, you know, Lakeson wouldn't even, anyway. So there's two, three items I think matter. Um, and I wanna paint it for you. If you go, go take a walk up Lexington one day on, in the 70s, 80s, it's like Detroit up there. All right, it's the Upper East Side. And it's like Detroit down Lexington. Okay, there's nothing there. There's storefront vacant everywhere. First thing on the paperwork and the bureaucracy. I'm, a, I'm actually an attorney. Uh, I still keep my license. I practice labor employment law. And I spend like an unbelievable amount of time on the paperwork. I get it's all, not all city paperwork. Um, I was like, oh, I'm not a lawyer anymore. Thank God. Or no, I guess not really. Um, so if I was to give you one piece of advice on the paperwork is make it one form once a year. We always meet with our staff once a year. We have them re-sign paperwork for the state. One form once a year. We can do that. Rolling forms on a constant basis, all it does is, I spend all my, not all, but uh, I'd say well over 10% of my time doing it, okay? And I'm an attorney, so forget, I mean, I can't even imagine other people, right? <coughs> Second, the surcharge. I'd like to talk about this, for, I don't know, hopefully not over my time, but 
All right, so you guys know the federal law says that federal law says that if you don't take the tip credit, you can share tips between the front and the back of the house, right? That's how Cali and all those other states do it, right? The way I see the surcharge is it allows us to basically do that, much the way they do in Miami and other cities where the surcharge effectively becomes the tip, right? You go to anywhere in Miami, not just hotels, it's 20% 20, 20 of the bill, that's it, okay? Now, I wanna go through the classes of people that this is beneficial for in terms of the businesses, clients, and the employees. First, I don't wanna correct you in a way, but I do. This training program, I was like, a, I was like laughing. I was like, is that a joke? What they're talking, what they're talking, I've talked to that, to the Small Business Administration every year because I'm trying to get a CO for three years. And every year I pay the FDNY like $10,000. And because at the FBA, I can't even get <coughs> stuff through the DOB. The fact that they're talking about training program is a joke. There are no cooks. I'll put in perspective with a fact. This is a fact. When we opened in 2011, I put a post for a cook on Craigslist. I'd get like 60 applications. Now I get like maybe 10. And I've been paying above the minimum wage for years. Maybe 10, and five of those are like, I worked in the Hale and Hardy. Okay, I'm not offense against Hale and Hardy, but like that, that doesn't work in, a, in, a, in an upscale dining establishment. There are no cooks. Now part of the reason is because my parents and my grandparents came to this country, they didn't understand English, they worked in kitchens. Okay, that was a steady labor flow for us. Half my, I'm Greek, man. I, I, know, I, don't, I know more people in restaurants than like I do in, in white collar jobs, okay? But right now, those people can go be Uber drivers. They go be Lyft drivers. They don't have to work in kitchens. You can train all you want, man, and there are no, there is so little labor. So the only way for us to, to I'm, didn't ask any restaurant person, any restaurant person, biggest problem, I cannot get people, biggest problem. So what's the best way to get people? Well, you generally have to pay them better. Right? So if I have a surcharge, what I can then do is take that and distribute it amongst all my employees with, 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 uh, on merit, on seniority, without regard for the, the, the artificial nature of the, the tip pool. And I want to ask, you should ask yourselves this question. And I want every city council person to ask themselves this question. When you've gone out and you've tipped, have you ever tipped because the food was good? Have you ever tipped because it came on time? Have you ever tipped, as my mother says, because the bathrooms were clean? My mom's like obsessed with the bathrooms. Okay, it's like her whole thing. Well, then that tip didn't get to those people. It didn't. It went to the front of the house, the servers, because those people can't participate in it. So it is creating an economic disparity. And you, do you understand how this is gonna feed itself? You go, okay, good. So it's equitable for the workers, and then I guess, and the client's paying more, and it's, it's a joke, I'm, I, whatever. I'll, you said me to be quiet, I'll be quiet. So I'll just spare the part about the clients, but you know, wh what do you think, how do you think it's gonna get paid for? Are they worried about what, the, the tax on the, on the 20%? Or are they, what are they, they don't think we're gonna raise prices the other way? Like it's like a, it's net net, they're, they're even. It's ridiculous. Sorry about that. My name is Peter Fahey, I'm representing St. Pat's Bar and Grill today. We're located at 22 West 46th Street. So today, just basically what I'm gonna talk about, we've got 28 staff working underneath us. Out of those 28, nine of them are kitchen, all right? We've, as we said, all small businesses are suffering at the moment, whether it be labor mandates, sales tax, property, sa property tax, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, where we're suffering most is on our street between, on 46th between 5th and 6th, on the corner of 46th on 6th, there's an alignment of trucks between nine and 13 trucks. They're every morning from 5 a.m. to roughly 1 to 2 p.m. every day. Now, I see them in the morning time when I go in there, they'd be fighting on the corner of the streets to get the right spot, f to get the, the best spot to sell their goods, whatnot. Now, these guys, do they have fr food certificate permits? Do they have, they've no standing, allocated standing points? I mean, it's just, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy, like, you know, do they come under the same line of <coughs> wages, the, like, you know, whatnot? Uh, what else? The garbage control, the city bins, garbage city bins, okay? Uh, they're filling the garbage city bins with their own garbage after their day's work. They're leaving the streets in an absolute mess where there's no control of them uh, whatsoever, you know? That's basically my point on that. 
So um, uh, my name is Pete Fitzpatrick, and I represent Allied Management. And fortunately for me, most of these guys back here are partners of mine in one form or another. We've got a, a mid-sized restaurant group called Allied, and uh, about 11 restaurants we have. They're mostly pubs. They're smaller. And the thing, what we need is we've been developing over, and it's, first of all, it's, it's great that you guys up there, you know, you're a delivery man. You're in a restaurant. You guys understand what we're banging our heads on the damn wall about all the time. Just to reiterate what this gentleman was saying, to us, it, it was like a kick in the pants. I mean, we have back of the house. He, here's how that thing nets out in real life. So you have a party. You have a Christmas party. You have a $2,000 Christmas party. You take an 18% tip against that. The people who did the, the vast majority of the work are the kitchen guys. They built the buffet. They put up the chafing dishes. They brought the stuff up. They brought the stuff down. They break. We can't include them in the tipping process. So now you're giving an 18% tip to the front of the house. Come on. I mean, that should, should be just something that's left to us because that's how you keep good staff. You throw them a few dollars. It's a Christmas. We can't do it anymore. The front of the house knows that we have we, – the mandate is we can't do it. They'll jump on us. So you took that, that was taken away from us. But – we're, what we need from the city, we were talking with the, the people from the council before, not the council, the, whoever these guys were, the, it was a circle. We need partners with the city. We can't have and survive a hostile environment with DOB, with Department of Health. We've partnered up with a lot of our, you know, AFI, the food uh, guys, Budweiser, Heineken. They've, we, we look as partners. We have to help each other. Pete has 18 food trucks on the block. We could survive the minimum wage. It's okay. We'll work through it. We'll figure it out. We can't, he can't have a lunch. That's the Brazil block, 46th Street. I think there's been four restaurants closed on that block. I mean, are you kidding? We don't even know who to talk to. Who the hell do we go to and say, hey, listen, we got 18 food trucks. What's going on? How do we move them? Are they permanent? We don't know. I got... John Doherty over there from 35th Street. He's been waiting since, I got to tell you, I think, is it October? September. Uh, September to get his gas turned on. We had a fire. You know what you need to turn on gas? A flashlight and a wrist to go like this. That's it. We can't get it done. Uh, Frankie here. We were talking a couple minutes ago about there's a big rush to blame the landlords with the increases in rent, increase in rent. And that is true. When you get a new lease, it's a nightmare because they can start from anywhere. Okay. Since uh, four years ago, the, the, he's got 75% of the real estate tax increase, the base increase. I, I'm not positive, but the real estate taxes in that building in the last four or five years have went from about 114000 to what do we know? 142. He's got 75% of that pickup. You guys could do the math. And figure, I mean, this is crushing. Uh, Paul Barbet from Hurley's has been waiting on a, on a C of O for how many years? For three years in May. We've, we, he hired a company called Milrose. We have another expediting company called RPO. These are professional expediters. They know the city hall. They know the DOB. They still can't get anything done. Four years he's been waiting. Um, Nick, here's something that's going to make you, you, you folks up there crazy. This never happened before. Nick applied for a liquor license in a place we have on Restaurant Row. Um, now, you know you have to go through all that, the, um, the community board and all that stuff, and then it gets up, kicked up to the state. So years ago, three or four years ago, we would have the restaurants finished, completed, built out, done, and then kind of wait around for two, three, maybe four weeks for the license. He applied for his license, uh, it was October 3rd. He got it a week before Thanksgiving, okay? That's from Albany. We, uh, we, we, put a pr we put plans for approval in the 10th of October. Nothing, zero, nothing. I mean, we don't even know who to talk to. Who can, is there something, like if we had an advocate, somebody could say, what's going on? Can they push it? So what do we do for advocates? We get Milrose, a big-time, expensive expediter. RPO, another big-time expediter. We even hired uh, Walter Gorman and Associates, and they're the expediter for Rock Center. He still doesn't have gas on. So you talk about employees before. How many employees did you have to let go, John? I don't even know. 
Seven employees we had to let go. You know, we didn't want to let any of them go. These, they got kids going to college. They got things to do. We can't hold on to them. So it was all, and again, it was all back of the house stuff. Because you could put a million heaters in the place and keep the bar open. But you, if you don't have gas, you can't, you can't turn a pilot on. So that, that's the problem. We all, have, we all have problems that are similar, but they're also dissimilar. And we need a partnership with the council, with you gentlemen and ladies up there. And there's got to be a way we can move these things along. I mean, God forgive me, you talk about graft. I mean, if somebody came in and said, listen, I'll take care of this whole thing, I, I, can, I can 10 grand just to get it done. This is the thing. Nothing is happening. You can't move anything forward. You can't get anything through. It goes into an abyss. And we really, Paul just told me today, I think, did you just kind of get a, a CEO? Uh, we got this, yeah, this wasn't even a new CEO. This was a reapproval. He got a reapproval. The other thing, you guys, now, uh, this is, oh, I can keep going on. The ADA, these ADA claims are outrageous. And here's the problem. Here's how you know that this is all, um, uh, yeah, it's all, it's all ambulance chasing because when they come to us, this is the way the whole trajectory goes. We get something from a lawyer that says, you have ADA violations, then I'll list them, Okay. Then it goes into a horse trade. We'll say, they want 200 grand. We'll say, well, we'll give you, you know, we'll give you 10. They'll say, well, we want 150. You give them 15. And this is the way it goes. As soon as they get paid, do you think that those lawyers follow up whether those ADA things were cured? Not a prayer. It's a shakedown. We would be happier if you guys from the city or DOB would come and say, listen, this is what you got to do. Fine us. We don't mind because if we're in violation, we're in violation. We're okay. I don't need some clown from 33rd Street to come up and bang me for, <laughs> for, for, for 15 grand just to pay a client, and he's taking half. It's such, a, it's such a shakedown. It's not even funny. And that's pretty much, I apologize for getting emotional on you gentlemen and, gentlemen and ladies, but we're, we are under serious, serious, serious pressure. And I could see within these guys here, I mean, there's, there's three or four of these places that might not be here like after St. Patty's Day. We're that close. And the reason we did this, the reason we're all, like we were saying before, everybody here is either an immigrant or the son and daughter of an immigrant. You know, we're, we're happy to do this work. You know, we, we're happy to do food and bev. We want to do food and bev. You were saying before, we don't want to do HR. We can't. We don't want to, ha we don't want to be, um, you know, the, guy, the guys who go down the city and uh, file the stuff. What do you call them? The um, expediters. That's that we can't do that. We're here to do food and bev, and we're happy to do food and bev. And we're happy to give you a great restaurant and a great experience and a great meal in a clean place that you could eat off the floor. The, another thing, too, uh, uh, and I'll be out of your hair, uh, folks. Um, the guys from uh, McHale's, so what they got was they got a, we had a, a, a big leak on the roof of the building. And what happened is the roof kind of dropped some stuff, some plaster and sheetrock. On the morning, we just happened to get a Board of Health uh, inspection, which was okay. They gave us um, a B, an a, an a, a B, a B with an A pending on the on the on the grades, right? We went, we got them complied, and we did everything we were supposed to do. We haven't seen anybody since. So if you go on the website, if you go on any of the places, we're still sitting with a B, and we're good to go. Just send us somebody to inspect it. That's all we want. Come, and if if it's not right, then then tell us. You can't sit on these things. Nick versus has been waiting for the building department to get their act together since October, October, November, December, January. Did you pay your February month yet? 10,000 a month, 50 grand, he's out. That's why you gotta start. The second you buy a pub or a restaurant, you gotta start opening, you gotta get moving because you got debt service or rent that's piling on you. He's 50,000 behind the eight ball. He hasn't even flipped one hamburger over there. That's the problem. We need a partnership with you folks in the council and the, the, the departments in the city we need to work together because we're all in this together. Our, the taxes that we get from the city come from us. The employment we get from the city comes from us. Payroll tax comes from us. We're happy. That's part of being in New York. We get it. But we cannot be banging our head against DOB, Board of Health, Con Ed. We, 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 that's what's killing us. I'm not sure if it's overregulation or just apathy. I don't really know what the heck is going on down there, but we can't get through. I mean, when the state agency, you guys know, when a state agency comes in two or three more or four months ahead of the city agency, that's a problem. I mean, we can walk here. That's it. All right, Frankie.
Okay, getting back to the uh, tip credit, we need to keep the tip credit. If we don't keep the tip credit, where do we get the front of house staff? Front of house are making good money. They're making upwards of $25, $30 an hour. I have a restaurant on restaurant row called Bourbon Street. All my front of house staff are on Broadway. They're doing shows. They're waiting to do shows. They're doing auditions. They're all part-time workers. They're all working 20, 30 hours a week. If they're not making $30 an hour, they're not going to stay in the restaurant business. They are going to go out and drive an Uber car. So we should be allowed to take care of the back of house. We're not allowed to do that. Our wage staff, if directed, would give a portion of their tips to the back of house because they understand how important it is for the back of house to do their job correctly because back of house performing correctly is enhancing the front of house. So that needs to be addressed. If we have to pay our front of house $15 an hour, as opposed to the 10 we're paying now, if we're taking a $5 tip credit, that would, with the hours that we're operating in front of the house, would probably cost us about 250000 extra in payroll, plus payroll taxes. We can't afford that. That would put me out of business right now. If I have to come up with another 250000 a year, that puts me out of business. Tip credit, we need it. We need it to stay. And um, we need to be able to take care of the back of house better. Like as Pete mentioned, when we do parties at Christmas time, month of November, month of December, we do a lot of parties. We do six, $7,000 parties with 18%. We should be able to kick some of that back to the back of house. The minimum wage went up to $15 an hour. My dishwasher gets $15 an hour. My porter that's sweeping the floor gets $15 an hour. My cook that was on $15 an hour, he's not on $15 an hour anymore. He's on 17 he's on 19 he's on $20 an hour. They all went up in salary because everyone got bumped up. It wasn't just the minimum wage that got bumped up. The, the people that were there before that were making $16 an hour, $15 an hour, they went up to 18 19 20 And uh, like it's hurt us right across the board. So, I mean, anything that can be done to preserve the tip credit would definitely help us. I want to thank you, gentlemen. Um, I do want to follow up on some of your issues. I'm going to give you my card. I want to know about the CFO, the gas, um, and the other issues that you're faced with that are preventing you from opening up. Um, and I promise I'll do that. I want you to know that your testimony is going to be the... I can't deliver on everything. I wish I had a magic wand to make all of our problems go away. But we're going to prioritize your needs and come up with uh, a format that we can challenge the issues that you're faced with. I'm hopeful that we can start a proactive approach versus a reactive. We shouldn't wait for restaurants to close down before we figure out how to make it right. And that proactive partnership that you're referring to is what you would want from government. So I promise you that I will be focused on that with my colleagues that sit on this committee, that you won't be forgotten, and we're going to get ahead of the problems, not try to correct them when they happen. Can I say one thing very practically? Instead of nonsense, sorry. Instead of nonsense training programs and ridiculous uh, things that don't matter in the real world, if they could use that money and hire people to actually help us in the DOB like they're supposed to and get to a decision maker, I've had SBA people push something halfway through the DOB, and the DOB kit basically said, F you, right, or told me to buzz off, and then they dropped it. Spent all that money on people to help us, so we have to hire expediters for $30,000, and instead, you know, just do it that way. Drop all those programs or waste the money. It's just, Councilman, it's just like we were saying before. It's, Thank you. It's a partnership that. mentality. If we could get that from you guys at the council and from the, the city agencies, We'd be good. We'd be okay. But, but we, we definitely need a partnership. We need a working partnership. I and, agree. And thank you very much, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you for being here. Gentlemen. Gentlemen. Oh, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, sir.
I, I would love to. I would. I, I don't. I don't know I who. You're I, asking us now. I don't know who I would ask. Okay. But a lot of these problems too, uh, Councilman. A lot of these problems too, like. You know, the restaurant business in New York for years chugged along. We chugged along on volume. We chugged along because the city was busy. Fees. Things were good. And now we're, we went from like, and it, it, it's partially due to wages, partially due to a whole lot of stuff, but we went from 60, 70 miles an hour down to zero. It seems like that. And now we're all, we're all running around saying, what the hell's going on? Like, the profits are – why anybody would be new and go into this business? Mm -hmm. I've been in – I've been in uh, my, oh, my first – restaurant in Manhattan in 82 so I've been doing it for a long time I've never seen but there's such a contentious attitude between DOB Board of Health I mean it's almost like the, you you actually hit on it before about when you were saying I never thought about it that way the the retaliatory nature of some of this stuff that everybody here is afraid of like the first thing we're saying is they're having a meeting should we go <laughs> you know I saying I don't know if we want to go do we want maybe we'll go but we won't say where the pubs are maybe we'll go we might you know I'll be vague but it's almost as if it's almost as if they come in. Have you ever had a place not get a fine? Very rarely. They're gonna find something. Generally, exactly. they're gonna find right, something exactly. that isn't enough to change your A from a B. They're gonna clock you for something. You figure, let's say you have a. I'm just guessing. You board a health guy, paying a hundred dollars, two hundred fifty a day or whatever he's getting. He's gonna come out. You know, you, they gotta feel they gotta make the balance. They gotta pay him out. They gotta pay him back. We we'll send them out the field. That's the way we feel. I know it's probably not true. That's the way we feel. What about different inspectors coming up with different scenarios uh, where an inspector comes in and says, no, this is wrong. You correct it. Another inspector comes in and says, it's still <laughs> I know, wrong. I know, uh, I know. You, I know. That actually, that actually is funny. That's, more, that's very specific, and I'll tell you, I can guarantee everybody in here would agree with me. The ADA stuff, oh, my God, you're like in La La Land. They're talking, you know college trigonometry to me and I, I like I, I'm, a, I'm an algebra guy from high school I don't even know you just give us the meets and bounds as the city we would be this is one of the things we would be happier for you guys to handle you know come out tell us what we need to do we're gonna do the best we can to do it if we drop the ball on that's okay we just got to get these lawyers off the side of our neck they're looking for two hundred thousand dollars because uh, who's ramp they can, his ramp his ramp was the pitch on the ramp it's supposed to go, I believe Frankie said, a, 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 a foot, yeah. His pitch, the, the measure, the, the thing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's short. I mean, and they come out and they, the numbers, it's not like, listen, we're going we're gonna to make you behave. We're going to find you a $1,000 or $500 because your ramp is, get a new ramp. That's what you guys would do. That's okay. These guys are, we're going to sue you for 200000 You're not allowed to argue precedent in the, in the health department. In other words, I cannot go in and say if someone issues a new violation and I can prove that that structure mm. and that setup had been the same for six years, I cannot argue the precedent should apply in assessing this inspector's mm. uh, uh, interpretation. This interpretation. Of, right. So that's kind of like what you were yeah, so saying that's before that's with saying, the interpretation right. from so, the Board so, of Health guys. So because we can't argue precedent in any way, it's a constant moving target of mm. compliance. Depending on it, so all you need is one person to say one thing, and then all of a sudden that becomes effectively code. The, the, the issue that I refer to is after being in business for 30 years, a bakery received a violation that the sink was too far yeah, from the, the cappuccino machine yeah, the that issue. was too close that. to the yes. door now. Yes, that was my problem. Yes. So to correct yes. the sink being closer to the, cap of machine, the cappuccino machine. Correct. Created another violation that was too close to the door. I had the same problem. That's so what I'm referring to. That's why I know the precedent argument. Because so I walked in to the to the health department. I said, for for the better part of 30 years for the building and six years that I've been here, no one has said that there's a problem with the sink issue. This one person comes and makes a sink issue argument, and you know I can't I cannot make that argument. We cannot make that argument. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. I have so these much. cards for you. And we have one final uh, person testifying, Jim Quint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Joe Nye, Council Member Perkins. Uh, my name is Jim Quint. I represent Duncan Brands. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the hardships that Duncan Brands franchisees face as small business owners in the restaurant industry. 
As you know, Dunkin' is the largest storefront operator in New York City. They have over 630 locations and provide over 12,500 jobs. But these are not corporate-owned stores. Contrary to, public, uh, or to the misconception, they're a network of small business owners who have chosen to franchise with Dunkin' Brands. These are franchisees who are no different than the thousands of other small business owners across the city. They're responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of their businesses, hiring and retaining workers, and managing their own finances. They are the people who take out the loans, assume the debt, and all the responsibility that comes with running a small business. Over the years, the cost of rent and supplies and maintenance and other costs have increased with inflation, but these are, uh, are expected cost increases that they can you know, plan for. Unfortunately, we hear a lot of comments from elected officials about wanting to help small businesses grow and create jobs. You know, the single largest increase in their budgets has been a flurry of new regulations, rules, and laws that seek to micromanage their day-to-day -day operations and end up increasing their costs. They impose new fines, you create new administrative hurdles, which all cost these business owners money. Often under the guise of very well-intentioned public policy pursuits, these regulations um, have little, like, uh, little or no, uh, not effect, but <laughs> the new rules actually threaten the way that people do business. And one of the, um, over the years you've seen both in New York City and New York State, uh, which both of you gentlemen have experience in on both uh, city and state government, uh, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in the minimum wage, uh, newly imposed paid sick leave laws, scheduling rules, menu labeling changes, increased delivery fines, and we have new organics recovery requirements in New York City for commercial businesses. All of these things, all of these things raise the cost of doing business. One of the things in particular um, that I want to talk about, and I only have two things I want to raise, I don't want to take up too much of your time, <coughs> but the first thing is the so-called fair work week laws. These were passed in 2017. It was a package to provide advance notice of scheduling to employees and create protections against lost hours. These laws have actually led to less hours and less opportunity for many employees looking to pick up additional hours when seeking to fill a shift left open by someone who calls out sick or otherwise. This adversely affects both the employees and the small business owners throughout New York City. Um, and let me just run off a few things that the Fair Work Week laws have uh, impacted. Number one, it makes it harder for small business owners to provide their employees with flexible scheduling and addi additional shifts when requested due to the imposition of penalties, which the council at the time called a premium pay. Um, since employees do not have to provide at least two weeks notice before calling out, nor do they ever because you don't know that you're going to be sick or have an emergency or have to take care of a loved one with two weeks notice, you find out 24 hours ahead of time. That doesn't matter in the law. The law says that if you call out and someone wants to replace you, the person they replace you with has to be paid a premium, mm -hmm. and that adds to the cost of doing business. Um, it harms employees who value their flexibility and part-time work by preventing them from picking up additional hours. If I want additional hours, I have to make sure that I'm swapping out a shift with someone, and that's not always possible for things to do. Not all the employees are going to know each other, and even if they do, they won't know when some shift is open. So people who are looking to get extra hours don't have that opportunity oftentimes. Um, it also reduces the quality of customer service, right? So if somebody calls out and the restaurant owner can't actually get someone else in to fill that shift or they don't want to have to pay this premium pay, they're going to leave that shift open. Now you have a full shift that is understaffed and the customers that are coming in are not getting the customer service that they uh, deserve and rely upon. And those, uh, those shift workers are now forced to actually work two or three times as hard just to maintain that same level of work. Um, it stifles business growth. It prevents further investment by small business owners. I can't tell you how many times I hear from folks that they're concerned about expanding their business because they don't know what next is going to come from the government. The other, the other costs of, of supplies and, and maintenance and all the other, the, whatever it is they have to purchase, they, they can kind of forecast that. Mm.
but it, when government comes in and decides that they're going to put these new uh, restrictions on business owners, th there's no way for them to know that that's coming. Um, and it also creates a cottage industry for plaintiff's attorneys by opening up small businesses to costly litigation under the guise of protecting employees. Some of the previous people who testified talked about this problem, and it is indeed a very serious problem and a very costly uh, undertaking for small business owners who have very limited profit margins and, uh, and struggle every day to maintain their businesses. The last thing I want to talk about is the Organics Recovery Pilot Expansion. The New York City Council passed the law in 2013 to create a commercial organics recovery program for stadiums, <coughs> arenas, hotels, you know, large <coughs> entities, uh, catering halls, and the like. They had to have over 7,000 square feet of space or over, depending on where they were, it might have been 15,000 square feet of space, or if they were a chain, there had to be two or more that had more than 8,000 square feet of space. But in the law, they set it up that the sanitation commissioner is obligated to determine whether there is sufficient capacity within a 100-mile radius of the city to process this organic waste that is being generated. Now, in addition, the commissioner is supposed to determine whether the cost of processing the organic waste is competitive with the cost of disposing of the organic waste in a landfill that is up to 100 miles away. Okay? Note that. Up to 100 miles away. So... As organic um, waste processing capacity increases within the region, then the commissioner is able to phase in the requirement of increasing the number of commercial enterprises to source separate the organic waste. While this latter clause allows for the expansion of this program, the City Department of Sanitation has not conducted or provided the results of a study on sufficient capacity. The department also chose to impose commercial organics recovery on all food service establishments that are part of a chain with 100 plus locations within the city confines, within the five boroughs. This expansion doesn't take into account the amount of organic material that's actually generated by each location, the costs incurred by the small business owners to hire carters to find a carter that actually will accept and, and pick up the organic waste, um, or anything regarding to the, um, the size of the store, uh, the ability for uh, them to put different containers that are required back of house, and mind you, this is all back of house, not front of house, because um, I think people have a tough enough time figuring out the, uh, the overall um, you know, recycling process, but we're getting there. Um, and so one of the things that we call on you to is please, like we think the New York City Council should call on the Department of uh, Sanitation to revision, to revise the expansion of this commercial organics recovery program and make it something that is, uh, that is efficient and, um, <laughs> for lack of a better word, doable. Jim, what is the cost for some of uh, the Duncans um, to comply with the rec organic recycling? It's TBD, all right? So this is new to the, or to the, it goes into effect on February 15th, and we'll find out what the costs are, but the costs are going to increase because now you have to have not just a, um, you don't have to just have a uh, recycling uh, pickup along with your normal garbage. You'll have to have recycling, you'll have to have normal garbage, and then you'll have to have organic waste recovery pickup. So just imagine it's, you know, it's just adding another. It's adding another piece to that that uh, that pie. Is there is is, is compounding <coughs> costs? Yes. Is it so because not because not everybody. Oh, it'll be measurable. We just don't know yet because it hasn't started. It starts in, on February fifteenth. Yeah, but aren't they making contract agreements now? Because I'm sure it's the whoever's picking up the commercial carding is not going to be equipped to. Correct, but we don't yet have a full list of who is approved by the Business Integrity Commission to collect organic waste and not every entity that collects uh, you know, normal waste and recyclable material is also required. Collected. Not, not, not even required, able, willing. This goes into effect when? February 15th. What would you like to see done um, besides We'd getting rid of the whole program? No, no, no. It, everybody, and, and we understand the need and the intent of the law and the expansion. Um, there's no question about that. But the approach hasn't been one that is doable. That 
it, it's going to be very difficult for people to comply. It's going to be very costly. If you have a business that has that is a 400 square foot kiosk or a walk up window like you have down the street here on Cortland, there's nowhere to put an extra bin. There's nowhere to turn inside the place. I mean, you, you, you're very limited in your space and your capacity. Aside from that, they're not generating a lot of waste, but they still will have to put everything that is an organic material to the side and figure out how to get someone to come and collect it every week, every you know three times a week, whatever that requirement will be. Are you going to be required to sort through your organic? So is this going to be the beans versus everything else? Or no, no, all the, the organic material can go in one, mm -hmm. but it has to be source separated from everything else. You, know, I, I, you guys should be very careful with this one because this could be imposed on the restaurants across the board sooner or later. Uh, well, that's the concern, right? So they, if, they are, if they're expanding this into an a arena where they're not taking into account um, the, the amount of organic material that's generated by a particular business, that's telling you something. It's, and, and we get it. The overall goal is laudable. It's just the, the approach is... is it so this will also contribute to congestion problems, I'm going to guess, because if these trucks have to make their way from one neighborhood to another neighborhood, certainly they're not going to be a capacity. I don't imagine we're going to have a tremendous amount of volume of organic recyclables. Is this you're adding another a truck or you're adding a, a larger truck, depending on, I, I'm not a sanitation expert, but uh, however that works out, we, uh, I would ask you to ask the sanitation department what the pickup requirements are. We have our work cut truck. out for us, uh, yeah. council so, member. Sounds like um, an exciting road. And as far as the, four wor the uh, fair work week uh, predictable uh, scheduling, um, What's the number of employees that are needed? It's not necessarily the number of employees, but you have to have your, if you're in a, uh, a business that's 30 or more establishments across the country. So they, they're specifically talking about chain restaurants. So if you have less than five employees? You well, you, no, it's 15 or more. 15 or more employees, which if you're doing two shifts, lunch and dinner, uh, you're certainly. Uh, but again, you have to have 30 or more across the country. That's that's another stipulation. It's you know, the the gentleman who's talking about owning a place on Forty Second, he's not required to give that two weeks advance notice. You know, no, that's not that's that's a different entity. So we have some work to look at that as well. So regardless of how many you may own, just because you are a franchise operation. Yes, sir with more than 30 locations in the nation. Yes, sir. You would have to comply. Right. And with the sanitation rule, it's if you have 100 or more within the city. Well, Dunkin' certainly has that. Yeah. Why did it between the two 30 and 100? I don't know. I didn't write it. I don't know. Before my time, before I think your time as well, correct? Organics, uh, council members, yes, before sir. you. Okay. Before both of you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. This will conclude today's hearing. I want to thank you all for your time and your testimony.